One of the things, or two of the things actually, that, that came together this week that I wanted to talk about uh, was firstly the question of race relations and secondly the question of the piece of legislation uh, that just uh, went through Parliament under urgency yesterday about the emissions training, uh, trading scheme. And I'm not going to get technical about that because uh, like every group in the country, when you look at the technical details of the emissions trading scheme, people's eyes start to glaze over. But the, do, the two came together in something of a coincidence. And why I wanted to talk about race relations is because I believe that that is absolutely essential that we have positive race relations in this country as part of the cohesiveness of our society. And I say this first and foremost because my experience in six years of being the Minister of Foreign Affairs was that I saw more societies ripped apart in often a brutal and an incredibly inhumane way on the basis of differences in race and religion than any other factor uh, that, you might, uh, that you might have seen. I saw it in Timor-Leste, uh, I saw it in, in Bougainville, I saw it in Bosnia, all of the places that I went to, and you see communities that are divided because of differences between people that really shouldn't matter because of our common humanity but used as the basis for violence, for rape and for destruction, and I never want to see that in our country. To a large extent, I think New Zealand can be really proud of our race relations. I believe that by and large we have a harmonious community that shows tolerance and shows mutual respect. And I say that from my heart because in my own electorate of Mount Roskill in Auckland, I have the most multicultural community in the country. When I was a boy growing up there, it was very much a Pākehā society. Today, 43% of my electorate is uh, from Asian countries, 18% from the Pacific. I number probably 110 different ethnicities. And one of the fantastic things that I do, and I did last week at our prize givings at our secondary schools, is go along and see kids from every part of the world growing up together studying together, working together, speaking with a Kiwi accent, regardless of what part of the world they came from, and, and treating each other with the sort of respect that uh, allowed me to say when I was Foreign Minister and went to New York that I didn't need to go to New York to see the United Nations. I had it in Mount Roskill, and it worked a hell of a lot better there than it did in New York. But <clears throat> I think the danger is that good, and, that good race relations can be destabilised, sometimes by political intent, people who seek to exploit it, and sometimes simply by political mismanagement. I saw that happen in the past. I saw it happen over the so-called Asian invasion and the, the, uh, the, the politics around that in the 90s. I saw it in 2003 after the Orewa speech. I heard it a couple of weeks ago in the speech from Hone Harawera, and I saw it again, sadly, in the passage of this legislation, uh, the, the emissions trading scheme through Parliament, done on the basis of, I thought, a pretty shabby political deal between National and the Māori Party that I thought really threatened the basis of the treaty settlement process. I want to say right up front, I support resolving the grievances of the past. We've got to resolve them, we've got to put them behind us, and we've got to move on. And if we don't resolve them, that will never happen. New Zealand is at the crossroads. Uh, we can celebrate the, the rich tapestry of our heritage and we can use it to move forward as a nation or we can reopen wounds and divisions where alternatively there should be healing. I want to talk about some of those issues today and the choices that the government has made over recent weeks and this week. Uh, it will make choices, of course, going forward in the global community of nations about climate change uh, when the Copenhagen discussions take place next week. It has made choices about treaty settlements relating to forestry in the last week, and sometime soon we think it will make choices about the foreshore and seabed issues. As I said before, I believe that the treaty process is essential, but it shouldn't be manipulated in a way that undermines what we've achieved and what we still need to achieve. We can choose a future that's based on principle and with the interests of all New Zealanders at heart, 
or we can have a country where one New Zealander is turned against another, Māori against Pākehā, in a way that my political party stands strongly against. We can make a promise to young New Zealanders that their lives will be as rewarding as they can achieve, or we can burden them with the costs of today's decisions and hold them back when we should be asking for so much more. We can have a New Zealand, I believe, that respects our heritage and finds solutions in the fair way that we as Kiwis always try to do. We can recognise and should recognise that wherever people come from, everybody that has come in successive waves of migration to this country have worked to contribute to it and make it a better place. I think one of the great things about our country is that over time, Māori and Pākehā have lived together, worked together, played sport together, we've married one another, we've raised our children together. And since the first New Zealanders died on the battlefields of World War I, we have fought alongside each other for a better future and for the values that we as a nation uphold. I'm a former Defence Minister and I take considerable pride that our soldiers, in their own words, quote, share a bond that no bo bullet can shatter, no bayonet can pierce. When I've been in Afghanistan, when I've been in East Timor, the Māori and the Pākehā soldiers together work as a team. There is nothing that divides them. When you contemplate that history, it's no wonder that so many, both Māori and Pākehā New Zealanders, were deeply offended by the comments made by Hone Harawera. The true offence was that by abusing one racial group in New Zealand, he thought that he could justify his side trip to Paris when his expenses were being paid by you, the taxpayers, to fulfil his duties at a meeting at the European Parliament in Brussels. Nearly everybody that has spoken to me about his comments mentioned their unease that this controversy was having a really negative effect on race relations. In times where our community is challenged, we look to our leaders to articulate our hurts and our hearts. So the Prime Minister had a choice. He could have condemned the comments and showed leadership. We can't reconcile New Zealanders and make progress together in an environment where hatefulness can flourish wherever it comes from, whether it comes from Pākehā or whether it comes from Māori. But he made a different choice, and I believe it was a cynical choice. The Prime Minister decided that shabby short-term political de deals were what was called for. So we saw the payback this week in Parliament, where National, with the help of the Māori Party, legislated, now listen to this figure, it takes a lot to get your head around, legislated a $110 billion subsidy for big polluters in the emissions trading scheme that they have adopted. There's very, there are very few people today that believe that New Zealand should not be part of a global solution to climate change. There's actually no dispute, even in Parliament, between most of the parties on that. The key issue is who pays. Labor says that the big polluters should pay. The government has said that Kiwi families should pay. It's loading every hard-working Kiwi family with a bill of $92,000 in today's dollar terms. That is based not on figures that I have invented. That is based on a report by the Treasury to the Select Committee of that figure of $110 billion. This is a decision that loads enormous costs on future generations, our children, and our, our grandchildren. Polluters, in our view, should pay for the cost of their pollution because the, we want them to change their behaviour. When the government subsidises them, they'll keep on polluting. When people who cause pollution actually have to pay for it, they change their ways and they find better, more efficient, more environmentally sustainable, and most importantly, from their point of view, cheaper ways of dealing with the problem. To hit the taxpayer with a bill of the size that I've just talked about, the national government had to do a cynical deal with the Māori Party. And in doing that, 
They reopened treaty settlements that were made full and final in the 1990s. They did this because some iwi who got forests in the 90s say their forests won't be worth as much now because of the change in the legislation. But every other forest owner in New Zealand is in that same position. The iwi negotiators say they didn't know about the chance of an emissions trading scheme when they signed the deal in the late 1990s. And they asked if the Crown had breached their obligations by not warning that a future government might adopt an emissions trading scheme. Last year, the Labor government took their question seriously. Nobody wants a settlement to be soured by bad faith. Crown Law, the official legal advisers of the government, retained a QC to consider the issue, Helen Aikman. Her report came back and said in the 90s, nobody knew that an emissions trading scheme would be adopted, uh, or if it was, what it might look like. So she concluded, and I quote, there is no evidence of a breach of the Crown's obligations. It was a very strong conclusion. There was no evidence of a breach of the Crown's obligations, therefore there was no basis for making a payment to the Iwis in reopening the treaty deal. The government, having paid for that advice, has ignored it. Instead, it's done a deal to advantage some large Maori corporates, which other forestry companies will not get from the government, which will give those Maori corporates an estimated 1.75 billion, one and three quarter billion dollars over time. Let's be clear, this is not a deal that will benefit Maori as a whole. The rebellion that took place and became obvious yesterday in Parliament from the Maori party membership itself, who have criticised their parliamentarians, recognises this. They recognise that the average taxpayer, Maori and Pākehā, will be paying for this bill it'll be huge and we'll be paying for it for a long time. They and the rest of us know that this will cost our children dearly. And the payoff to polluting businesses isn't compensation for that. This shabby deal, and I call it a shabby deal because it was made in secret, it was never put before the select committee, so it was never actually analysed and the implications understood, was simply about one thing, it was about buying Maori Party support for national shambles of an emissions trading scheme. I called it pork barrel politics. It's an old American saying. My colleague Shane Jones said it wasn't so much pork barrel politics as pork bone politics, because he said there wasn't much meat on it for the average Maori person that he represented. So I defer to Shane in that regard. <clears throat> Some corporates clearly saw that as a chance for a handout, and naturally, they've taken it. Some of these are very large in corporations, and they're very sophisticated business people. I regret that they're hiding behind some of the poorest people in the country who won't benefit from this at all. If they see a chance of getting hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayers' support, obviously, they're going to take it. Any other business would do the same. And I don't so much blame them for that. They're business people. If they can make a profit out of hoodwinking the government, yeah, that's fair game from their point of view. But I do blame the National Party that was prepared to use your money, the taxpayers' money, to buy off the Maori Party with a deal that does not stack up in terms of principle. I reject strongly the allegation that the Prime Minister has made that anyone who has concerns about this deal is playing the race card. I found it deeply ironic that I was accused of being racist for challenging this deal when he couldn't quite bring himself to say that about the comments made by Hone Harawera. But race is a red herring in this deal. It's about subsidies for big corporations. And I'm not going to shy away from saying so because some of those corporations, uh, those corporates happen to be Maori in corporations. I opposed a special deal for Rio Tinto, who own the smelter. They'll get uh, tens of millions of dollars. And I opposed the special deal for Naitahu Incorporation on the same basis. Most of you here will remember that 
the time when we as taxpayers had to pay for Rob Muldoon's supplementary minimum prices. You know, that was where you paid the farmer more for the lambs than the farmer got from the market. And as you remember, somebody had to pay for those subsidies, and again it was us, it was the taxpayers. I was a little young in those days, so I wasn't paying quite so much tax as some of you may have been. Subsidies aren't free. Ordinary New Zealanders have to pay for them, and in this case we will be paying for them and for generations to come. The burden of paying will fall ironically disproportionately on those least able to do so, hard-working Māori and Pākehā taxpayers alike. But my other objection is that this is not a time to put at risk the concept of full and final settlements. You see, Labor considered this sort of deal last year and decided not to do it. We looked at it and we decided that we would have created, if we'd done it, a permanent class of post-treaty assets. Assets that were once part of a treaty settlement that would forever be eligible for compensation if they were ever uh, affected by an adverse decision from government. If the government ever changed the rules relating to forestry or the tax law or the exchange rate, here is now a precedent for having to compensate the owners of an asset that had once been part of a treaty settlement. That's a bad precedent and it's a bad principle. Full and final settlement becomes impossible under that sort of deal. And as Shane Jones pointed out this week, by allowing some select corporations to top up their settlements, the government is simply keeping the grievance going. If you can never settle treaty grievances, there can never be healing, and you keep alive a grievance from one generation into the next. We've got to address grievances, but we shouldn't be sustaining them. The promise that I want to make to young Māori New Zealanders is that we will work as hard as we can to help ensure that their next generation will be a breakthrough generation. They understand tradition. They understand the future can be changed by education and by opportunity. And therefore, what a Labor government is about is about making sure that everyone gets a fair go. Everyone should be supported to ensure that they have the opportunity to, to fulfil their potential so that this breakthrough generation that we are thinking about, the new generation of young Māori and young Pacifica, can open any door, achieve any ambition, triumph in any test. Imagine if the government decided not to spend billions of dollars in coming years on subsidising polluters, but instead they decided that they'd invest the money that would otherwise go to the subsidies on the achievement and success of all young New Zealanders, and in particular in lifting the educational success of those who are underachieving. Imagine what their parents could do if instead of paying taxes to subsidise climate changing gases, they could take the pressure off their own family budgets. My vision is a quite different vision. It's a vision of Māori and Pākehā families whose taxes are not spent on subsidising big polluters, but instead invested in areas like science and education. And a young scientist in this sort of family gets a better start and gets the backing to find a job in a laboratory where he or she has the chance to develop breakthrough technology, for example, in one of the areas we're focusing on, reducing emissions from agriculture. I look forward to seeing young entrepreneurs Māori and Pākehā, who develop exports of clean technology to the world and create hundreds of jobs uh, here in New Zealand by doing so. I can think, and you can think, of many better uses of our money than giving it to big polluters. That's about the kind of country that we want to be. We want to be proud, we want to be forward-looking and hopeful. But alternatively, if the wrong policies are chosen, We'll continue the grievances, we'll continue to look backwards, we'll continue to look short term, and we'll continue to be ashamed. I want us to be the kind of country where we take these sort of issues seriously and not simply look for quick fixes. Where we take the principled option, not the cynical short term one. That's my approach to the foreshore and seabed issues as well. 
That's another issue that I really fear is being cynically reopened for politics and not for principle. The national government has indicated on a number of occasions that they plan to repeal the foreshore and seabed legislation. But it won't say when we'll start hearing the details of what it plans to replace the law. It won't disclose the deal that's either been reached or is being considered. It won't say how it's going to reconcile its arrangement with the Maori Party and its own national MPs who in 2003 criticised the bill, not because of what it believed it took away from Māori, but that it thought we were giving too much to Māori. The foreshore and seabed became an incredibly divisive issue in New Zealand, with big concerns being expressed from both sides. New Zealand's fears, in my view, were whipped up in a, a quite unprincipled way with National running our Save Our Beaches website, it suggested that we as New Zealanders were about to lose access to beaches around New Zealand. Now it's trying to erase that part of its political history. Back in 2004, Labor's process for dealing with the issue in a difficult environment could have been better. But for all of the criticism that I have heard, most people accept that the current foreshore and seabed legislation provides rules that aren't broken and that could be a good foundation for moving forward. They believe that it's good legislation for all New Zealanders. Reopening, reopening the foreshore and seabed issues by repealing the legislation, of course, might just be a cynical move by National and the Māori Party to create the perception, but not the reality of change. In reality, it may be no more than simply renaming the existing Act with pretty much the same arrangements. It's hard to see then why the country would be put forward potential grief just to put a new brand on a law that's working. But of course it may be more than that, in which case at least the government should tell us. Access to the beaches, in my view, is a birthright for all New Zealanders, Māori and Pākehā, and it must be preserved. Equally, we accept that where traditional Māori usage and rights exist, they should be respected. New Zealanders, I think, also respect the guardianship role that Māori have in many parts of the country and accept that protection of sacred sites uh, and customary activity is fully appropriate. Locally, we should be consulted before development occurs on the foreshore. Their traditional rights should be respected, but that's provided under existing legislation as the Ngāti Perot Agreement under Labor has demonstrated. Ngāti Perot wants that agreement honoured by the current government. If that can occur through negotiation between iwi and the Crown, what then is being fixed? Ngāti Perot successfully negotiated an agreement with the Crown under the existing law. That agreement recognises there is a special relationship and the Crown commits to consultation with Ngāti Perot at all levels of government. The agreement recognises sacred sites and the rights to undertake customary activity. The settlement maintains Crown ownership but provides full respect for Māori customary rights. That seems to be appropriate to me. It would be totally irresponsible for National, on the basis of a political deal, to repeal the legislation and leave uncertainty and the opportunity for disputes to fester unresolved. If the foreshore and seabed issue is left to the courts to resolve, we could be tied up in knots for years. The government has a choice of sticking with the status quo, which guarantees access, but allows for agreements around customary rights, or the alternative of never-ending court battles. Labor believes in access for all New Zealanders, but with respect for custom and heritage. National wants to reopen the Act. Labor asks, what isn't working? Will reopening court action help, or would it see the wounds fester? This is really about the kind of nation that we want to be, a respectful, forward-looking country, or one stuck in shabby short-term deals that divide New Zealanders and set one group against another. I believe that we can do better than that. We can be a country of opportunity and fairness for everyone. There is so much that we as New Zealanders 
have to be proud of, so much that we can achieve together. We can be proud of our bicultural foundation as a nation and the multicultural nature of our community today. It's part of our nationhood and we should celebrate the overall tolerance and the mutual respect on which good relations between our communities are based. New Zealanders can draw on our shared heritage to enrich our community or we can find cause for division and impose that on generations to come. What we are seeing are decisions that I believe take the wrong choice. What is missing is the leadership that brings New Zealanders together and I believe that we have the right to expect more. If we don't handle this well, there are bad consequences for this country. If we do handle it well, we can create a New Zealand that all of us can be truly proud of. Thank you very much. <clears throat>